are you a generous person? I want you to really think about that. Would you consider yourself generous? And if you do, what's the evidence that shows that you're generous? What would you point to? If you look up the most generous people in the world, the number one most generous person is said to be Bill Gates. Because of his foundation and because of the amount of money, it's not just in millions, it is in billions of dollars. He is considered the most generous person in the world. But I'm guessing when I ask the question, you feel a little uncomfortable. Not even just with the question, but even start thinking about myself as, huh, am I really generous? And I think this might be why we're uncomfortable. This is an interesting quote about generosity. We'd all like a reputation for generosity, and we'd all like to buy it cheap. Right? And we understand that quote and what it means. Because generally speaking, people were not made generous. Right? We get that, right? Generosity is not an inherent trait. Because of the brokenness of sin, we aren't generous. And we know it with kids, right? Do you, are kids naturally generous when they're little? Probably not. Right? One of the lessons as parents, right, when, when a child, a, a friend comes over or a cousin comes over for the first time and a little child, they have all these toys, right, what happens? Boom, those get tight around their fists, close to their chests, and maybe, just maybe, depending on how young they are or old they are, they'll say, mine, right? It's one of the early words a child learns. And so, a really important lesson for parents to teach children is to be generous, to share And I think for us, too, that's the fight. In our hearts, how can we be generous? And the reason I really want to speak about this today uh, is because if you started to look at the last couple of weeks, what we're doing in church, right? We're, we're talking about the mission of Emmanuel, that we exist to make an eternal difference in people's lives as we gather, grow, give, and go with God's word. And if you've been following along, if you remember, you would have thought to yourself, hey, wait a second, we talked about gathering, we talked about growing, we talked about going, but we didn't talk about giving. Because we're going to take not just one week, but three weeks to talk about that one word. And here's what I want you to see. That giving is not optional for a Christian. It's actually a mark of discipleship. At the same time, I also think that our thought about what that means and what that looks like and the why behind it may not be all that accurate. And so that's why it's really important. If God says that generosity is a mark of discipleship, then how can we be or even know whether or not we are following what God wants us to do there. And so to help us understand that, we're going to look at the words from the Apostle Paul today. And when the Apostle Paul wrote these words, there was an issue going on. It wasn't the generosity issue, it was actually a famine. That was the issue. Uh, when you read early uh, history of the world, there's a, a man, a first century historian named Pliny the Elder. Uh, he wrote about this... Uh, flood that was in Egypt along the Nile River. Uh, the Nile flooded 18 cubits higher than ever had in a century. And 18 cubits essentially is about from, a cubit is from my elbow to the top of my finger. It's about, and so 18 feet higher in the areas where the grain was growing. And so a poor grain harvest from the Egyptian around the Nile had this ripple effect in this known world. Uh, Acts chapter 11, uh, the prophet Agabus uh, predicted a famine which is really interesting because when he predicted that, it didn't even happen yet. It was going to be a couple of years later. Right after his prediction, the apostles quickly gathered funds to help for a famine that hasn't happened yet, but it was just so it's predicted. 
So you have this famine then in the early 50s AD that is affecting uh, especially hard the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And so there was a collection made amongst the churches that Paul started, especially right now around Greece. And so Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthians, and during this, in this letter he talks about this collection. And when you, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one thing. This is going to be our definition we're going to work with as Paul talks about the collection. A generous life is one that's a way of living marked by regular giving. Let's take a look at how Paul speaks about it. When you see these words, as Paul encourages generosity and a generous light, right? A way of giving marked by regular, a way of living marked by regular giving. What surprises you? He says, I am not commanding this. He actually goes to great lengths to make sure they know He's not commanding that. Uh, In chapter 9, he will say that um, God does not want your gifts that reluctantly are under compulsion. He wants you to give cheerfully, right? God loves a cheerful giver. Paul goes to great lengths to make sure this is not a command. But then you think about that. Paul was never shy at commanding anything. Can you imagine him saying to the Corinthians, I am not commanding you to be kind to each other. I am not commanding you to speak truthfully. I am not commanding you to be faithful to your spouse. Why, when it comes to generosity and giving, does Paul make sure that they know that this isn't a command? Because generosity is tied entirely to the heart. Generosity is never about motive, Never, or never about amount, but always about the motive. And that's kind of a scary thought if you bring you to think about it. Right? In the gospel lesson, you saw what greed looked like. Greed, the opposite of generosity. Greed is a sin. But here's the difference about greed. There is no external indicator in a person's life to say they are a greedy person. Right? If you're a liar, you know it, and people know it. If you're a, a bad spouse, you know it, your spouse knows it, and it, has effects in your, it affects your life. If you have anger issues, you know it by the tone of your voice, people know it, and it affects your life. But if you have greed issues, you don't know it. You don't see it. And actually... Uh, in a culture that is a lot now based on credit and in a culture that's very consumeristic, right? It is so easy to justify a greedy heart. But greed, right? Greed has nothing to do with the amount either. Same as generosity. So what do you do? If Paul's not going to command us, how do we figure this thing out is, answer the question, am I a generous giver? So instead of Paul commanding, he said, well, let's look at traits of generosity. What does generosity look like? And he gives an example with these Macedonian churches. Macedonia is in northern Greece. In the Bible, you have the book of Philippians, the uh, book of Thessalonians. They talk about the Bereans. Philippi, Thessalonica, that's the Macedonian area. And Corinth is in southern Greece. And so he starts to give this trait of the Macedonian churches. And he says, I want to test the sincerity of your love. So the realness of your love by comparing it to them. And notice, he says, here they are, in the midst of severe trial, their joy and extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. So these Macedonian churches were having a tough time of their own. And even though they're having a difficult time, they still found a way to give. And so you start to see somebody that giving doesn't have a lot to do with your external circumstance, right? Next thing he says, verse 3, they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. 
I don't think the Macedonian churches gave so much that they themselves were starving and that suddenly they themselves too now needed someone else to raise a collection so they can function. But I think what happens is when you have very little and then you give even just a little, it does affect you. It does change something in your life. And then the third thing, it says, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Have you ever urgently pleaded to take part in a collection for some nonprofit? Please, please, please let me also give away something of mine. And then you look at verse 2, it talks about their extreme joy. Right? All of this describes a, a heart. And we look at these traits, like how does someone do that? How do you feel so good, not based on external circumstances, so good about giving things away? Well, Paul says that. Here's how they did it. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. First to the Lord, Paul indicates in this whole thing, I think what that means, he talks about the grace of God four times in these verses. And when you know the grace of God, right, and we've heard about it, right, in the songs we have sung so far, the focusing on the grace of God. The children in their song shows what happens and how to live knowing you have the grace of God. At the end, we're going to sing a song about amazing grace, right? When you understand God's grace, it takes, it makes you look at your life as not your own, but strictly as a gift from God. I am here, I am in this location, I am in this place, I am in my vocation, strictly because of God's grace. And it changes my heart from one of ownership of all of these different things and getting credit for all of these things in my life to one of stewardship, understanding that God is the owner and God is the giver. You see the difference now. And you start to see the foundation that the Apostle Paul is laying to help us understand what a generous life looks like. So are you a generous person? In your mind, where did you go when I asked the question? Did you go to a mount right away? Because the one thing the Apostle Paul has not talked about There is no dollar signs in Paul's letter. There is no amount. There is no percent. But but I think we just want to know. God, just tell me how much, please. It's a lot easier. God, tell me how much time should I be giving. That's just so much easier. And I think sometimes, right, that's what we're trained for in in our life. Um, When we read about generosity, the only time you know about generous people is in how much they gave. And it's amazing sometimes. Right, even if you have kids in sports, right, you have to volunteer. Required volunteerism. And if you don't have to volunteer to take tickets or work sessions, then you can pay a little bit to, because you don't have the time. We get it, right? Children, if you're in high school, right, there is required volunteerism for graduation. You get your volunteer hours and it kind of defeats the word volunteerism. That's okay. It's a good lesson to teach that it's good to give your time to others. But giving is never about the amount. It's always about the heart. And so how do we know if we're generous? Well, I think we can test the sincerity of our love by comparing it to another church. I think we test the sincerity of our love by comparing ourselves to the Macedonians and their traits. And so here's what you have to do. You have to take a look at your life and you really have to take inventory of everything that you have and all of your time and see where it goes. And because here's the measure, can we say by looking at all of our life, that we are giving ourselves first to the Lord and then to everybody else. 
And right, it's never the amount. And we have to be careful because we, even when we look at the gospel lesson, when it came to Judas and to Mary, that's a little troubling when you really think about it. Because if we were there, right, we would have thought the same thing that, oh my goodness, she just dumped out a year's worth of wages. And if we would have pay, sold that, we could have took that money and we could have fed an entire family for a year. Judas has a really good point. But John told us, and Jesus made an example of something totally different. So that's you really got to be careful, right? So you think about giving myself first to the Lord. Um, one of the things that I, that I look at in life, right, is, right, we talked about gathering together and regular giving and regular gathering. And since the book of Genesis, essentially up until 2020 AD, regular worship was a part of the Christian life. And I think now, in a lot of people's minds, we can kind of justify irregular worship. Uh, even in the Christian community, we have justified it. The, now the stat is for pastors, a re regular worship means 3.2 times a month. Or I'm sorry, once every 3.2 weeks. So if you come once every 3.2 weeks, you are a regular worshiper. A few years ago, it was once every two. And then 15 years ago or 20, it was every week. What's changed? Nothing. What does the Bible say? You have to go every week. Nope. It just says regular worship. And so now as a Christian, we have to see what does my life look like when it comes to regular worship? Or when I think about my time and look at what, where I spend my hours, and then you have to give yourself some grace too. I, I remember when the twins were, were very young, our extra time was sleep. Uh, if we would have had to give outside of ourselves during those early years of the twins, we would not be here today. Right, so even when you talk about giving and, and looking at, at your life, you have to say, what are my priorities? Where has God placed me? But in, as a foundation is, can I say I'm giving myself first to the Lord? And if this sermon and these words of God as we start focusing on giving is a bit of a trigger for you. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yep, here we go again. All the church wants is my money. That is the furthest from the truth. The church doesn't want your money. And maybe we have, and I don't think maybe, we have at times been really bad as the church making that message clear. It's before my time, but I've heard about it, and I've seen them in in the histories of, of the files of different churches. Every year you get a giving statement from your church for tax purposes. Years ago, they didn't mail those out. They just printed out and on one piece of paper, you just grabbed it at, in church. There was your name and there was the amount that you gave. I suppose it saved the stamp for the church. But it probably wasn't the wisest idea, right? Can you imagine looking at that list and seeing your name like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm in the top five again. Thank me, God. Or you look at certain people like, oh, that's all they gave? Right? The dangers when it comes to those kind of things. And the church, even sometimes when at times the church is struggling to function, and so maybe the church leader, maybe the pastor got a little bit too forceful when it came to giving, and maybe a little bit of fire and brimstone and slamming on the ambo, That's not how God speaks. Paul says over again, I am not commanding you. It's not about the amount. God doesn't want your money. It has always been about your heart. That's what God wants. But here's the problem. We don't have hearts like that. And so the foundational truth when it comes to a life of generosity a life marked by regular giving, Paul says right at the end, 
you know. It's the truth that you know. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. It's an amazing gospel sentence because he takes the gospel and puts it in economic terms. That God is not investing in you to see what your return is going to be. That there is not this reciprocal relationship where God has given you love and you're giving love back to him and the more love you give to him and the more love he gives you back. Instead, God's love is 100% charity. And God's love is shown to you in the person of Jesus Christ, who was the richest person who has ever lived. Who then became the poorest person. Who became just like us. Poor, killable, even spiritually rich, he became spiritually poor. Right? God himself disowned his son, so we become spiritually rich forever. That's the heart of a generous giver. That's, I guess, the fuel that drives the engine of our giving. And when people hear this, they might think to themselves, shouldn't then we give more? Shouldn't, because of all of God does for us, make us want to give more? I guess the answer is, yeah. But the minute we talk about, shouldn't we give more? The minute we say, we must give to God. Then suddenly you're changing giving and generosity from a heart issue to a command issue. Instead, it looks like this. You are a generous giver because God looks to you and looks at you through the lens of Jesus Christ. God sees your less than perfect works as perfect in Christ. God sees our less than generous giving as amazingly generous in Christ. That's the foundational truth of the gospel. And that's where we start for the next couple weeks. We're going to use that foundational truth. And next week, we're going to see how God has put us here to help us make a difference and an impact in all the different areas where we live in. And then the Apostle Paul is going to help us see what it means to, to give when it comes to planning because the Bible and even right anything we do in life, there are plans involved. And as we look at those words, what is always going to be the heart of everything we say and do is that simple gospel truth. That because of Jesus, it brings joy to our generosity. That because of Jesus, we see our sincerity and our, the reality of our giving. And with Jesus, that we're able to truly have a generous life, one of regular giving in everything we do. Amen.